The Pacific Fur Company PFC, was an American fur trade venture wholly owned and funded by John Jacob Astor that functioned from 1810 to 1813. It was based in the Pacific Northwest, an area contested over the decades between the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland, the Spanish Empire, the United States of America and the Russian Empire. Management, clerks and fur trappers were sent both by land and by sea to the Pacific coast in the autumn of 1810. The base of operations was constructed at the mouth of the Columbia River in 1811, Fort Astoria, present-day Astoria, Oregon. The destruction of the company vessel the Tonquin later that year off the shore of Vancouver Island took with it the majority of the annual trading goods. Commercial competition with the British Canadian Northwest Company began soon after the foundation of Fort Astoria. The Canadian competitors maintained several stations in the interior, primarily Spokane House, Kootenai House, and Salish House. Fort Okanagan was also opened in 1811, the first of several PFC posts created to counter these locations. The Overland Expedition faced military hostilities from several indigenous cultures and later had an acute provision crisis leading to starvation. Despite losing men crossing the Great Plains and later at the Snake River, they arrived in groups throughout January and February 1812 at Fort Astoria. A beneficial agreement with the Russian-American Company was also planned through the regular supply of provisions for posts in Russian America. This was planned in part to prevent the rival Montreal-based Northwest Company NWC to gain a presence along the Pacific coast, a prospect neither Russian colonial authorities nor Astor favored. The lack of military protection during the War of 1812 forced the sale of PFC assets to the NWC. While the transactions were not finalized until 1814, due to the distance from Fort Astoria to Montreal and New York City, the company was functionally defunct by 1813. A party of Astorians returning overland to St. Louis in 1813 made the important discovery of the South Pass through the Rocky Mountains. This geographic feature would later be used by hundreds of thousands of settlers traveling over the Oregon, California, and Mormon routes, collectively called the Westward Expansion Trails. The emporium envisioned by Astor was a failure for a number of reasons, including the loss of two supply ships, the material difficulties of crossing the North American continent and competition from the Northwest Company. Historian Arthur S. Morton concluded that the misfortunes which befell the Pacific Fur Company were great, but such as might be expected at the initiation of an enterprise in a distant land whose difficulties and whose problems lay beyond the experience of the traders. Topic. Formation John Jacob Astor was a merchant of New York City and founder of the American Fur Company. To create a chain of trading stations spread across the Rocky Mountains to the Pacific Northwest, he incorporated an AFC subsidiary, the Pacific Fur Company. The commercial venture was originally designed to last for 20 years. Unlike its major competitor the Canadian-owned NWC, the Pacific Fur Company was not a joint stock company. Capital for the PFC amounted to $200,000 divided into 100 shares individually valued at $2,000 and was funded entirely by Astor. The American Fur Company held half of the stock and the other half divided among prospective management and clerks. The chief representative of Astor in the daily operations was Wilson Price Hunt, a St. Louis businessman with no outback experience who received five shares. Each working partner was assigned four shares with the remaining shares held in reserve for hired clerks. Fellow partners in the venture were recruited from the NWC, the members being Alexander McKay, David Stewart, Duncan McDougall, and Donald McKenzie. Astor and the partners met in New York on 23 June 1810 to sign the Pacific Fur Company's provisional agreement, to establish the fledgling PFC trade posts in the distant Oregon country. Astor's plan called for an extensive movement of large groups of employees overland following the route of the Lewis and Clark expedition and navally by sailing around Cape Horn. The venture was planned on methods used in the AFC for the collection of fur pelts. Complements of employees later called 
Astorians would operate in various parts of the region to complete trapping excursions. Outposts maintained by the PFC would be freighted necessary foodstuffs and supplies by annual cargo ships from New York City. Trade goods for the Pacific Northwest indigenous such as beads and blankets would be exchanged for fur pelts. Ongoing supply issues faced by the Russian-American company were seen as a means to gain more furs. Cargo ships en route from the Columbia were planned to then sail north for Russian America to bring much needed provisions. By cooperating with Russian colonial authorities to strengthen their material presence in Russian America, it was hoped by Astor to stop the NWC or any other British presence to be established upon the Pacific coast. A tentative agreement for merchant vessels owned by Astor to ship furs gathered in Russian America into the Qing Empire was signed in 1812. Company ships then were directed to sail to the port of Guangzhou, where furs were then sold for impressive profits. Chinese products like porcelain, nankeens and tea were to be purchased, with the ships then to cross the Indian Ocean and head for European and American markets to sell the Chinese wares. Topic. Labor recruitment The PFC required a sizable number of laborers, fur trappers and in particular voyagers to staff company locations. Recruiting for the company's two expeditions were led by Wilson Hunt and Donald Mackenzie for the Overland Party and Alexander McKay for the Naval Bound Group. All three men were based out of Montreal throughout May to July 1810. Hunt was designated to lead the Overland Expedition, despite his inexperience in dealing with indigenous cultures, or residing in the wilderness. It was suggested that Hunt instead trade positions with McKay and travel on the Tonquin. However, it was determined to keep Hunt in charge of the land party. The customary time for free agents to be sent into the interior from Montreal was in May, leaving few men left in the city available for hire. The recruitment effort stalled in part from the bitter treatment by the NWC and Hunt's lack of prior experience as a fur merchant, the source of many issues later on. PFC contracts were atypically favorable for hired men when compared to its Montreal competitors. Terms included a 40% larger annual salary, double the cash advanced prior to departure and a length of service lasting five years, rather than the more common two- or three-year employment. Topic. McKay's efforts During the summer of 1810, Alexander McKay hired 13 French Canadians for the Tonquin. The majority of the group remained in Montreal until late July, when they given directives to withdraw to New York City. A canoe provided transportation for the trip down the Richelieu River and Lake Champlain. At Whitehall additional men that were employed by McKay joined the southbound party, among them Avid de Montigny. On 3 August they reached New York City, with the group's hats decorated with party-colored ribbons and feathers, causing some Americans to believe them to natives. The following day lodgings at Long Island were reached and the scene was described by clerk Gabriel Franchere. We sang as we rowed, which, joined to the unusual sight of a birch bark canoe impelled by nine stout Canadians, dark as Indians, and as gaily adorned, attracted a crowd upon the wharves to gaze at us as we glided along. While waiting to depart for the Pacific, McKay met with British diplomatic official Francis James Jackson. The official assured McKay that in the event of war between the United States and United Kingdom, all PFC employees that were British employees would be treated as such. Topic. Hunt's efforts Thirteen men signed contracts in Montreal to join Hunt on the journey to the Pacific coast by land. Notably only one had previously operated under a contract lasting longer than a year. The generous cash advancements were taken advantage by three men who deserted before Hunt and the remaining group left the city for Michilimackinac in July. The party reached Mackinac Island on 28 July 1810. 
Acting as a major depot for the regional Great Lakes fur trade, the island was where Hunt focused on hiring more men for the company. The veteran fur merchant Ramsey Crooks was convinced to join the company and assisted in recruiting additional men. Over the 16 days spent there, a total 17 men were recruited to the concern with 16 being French-Canadian. This group of men, unlike those hired in Montreal, had extensive experience working in the fur trade as voyagers and other roles. Likely suggested by crooks, interested men already hired by other companies would have their contracts purchased from their employers. After the men were finally gathered in early August, Hunt and the party departed for St. Louis and arrived there on 3 September. The hired voyagers and fur trappers completed many transactions with various merchants in St. Louis and in the nearby French-Canadian settlement of Ste. Genevieve throughout September and October. These were recorded on the company ledger and particular purchases been argued as the men collecting goods to trade with various indigenous nations they would visit. In particular, these negotiations by the French Canadians have been thought to be steps towards later establishing themselves as independent traders in relatively unexploited fur regions. Most of the men in the Overland Party were engaged as hunters, interpreters, guides and voyagers. Topic. Oceanic component The advanced party was sent to create the initial base of operations at the mouth of the Columbia River. Necessary trade goods for deals with indigenous and needed supplies to establish the station were shipped on the same vessel in addition to beginning the company headquarters. This party would block any attempts by the NWC to create a station in the area. The ship Tonquin was purchased by Astor in 1810 to start commercial operations on the Pacific Ocean. The majority of the company partners, Duncan McDougall, David and Robert Stewart, and Alexander McKay would head this detachment. In addition, clerks Gabriel Franchere and Alexander Ross would join them on the planned voyage. Topic. The Tonquin. Under the command of Jonathan Thorne the Tonquin left New York on September 8, 1810. PFC employees numbered 33 men in total on board. The vessel landed at the Falkland Islands on 4 December to make repairs and take on water supplies at Port Egmont. Captain Thorne attempted to abandon eight of the crew still on shore, among them clerks Gabriel Franchere and Alexander Ross. The stranded men were taken on board after Robert Stewart threatened to kill Thorne. Communication between company workers was no longer held in English to keep the captain excluded from discussions. Company partners held talks in their ancestral Scottish Gaelic and the laborers used Canadian French. On December 25 the Tonquin rounded Cape Horn and sailed north into the Pacific Ocean. The ship anchored at the Kingdom of Hawaii in February 1811. Due to the possibility of men abandoning their posts to live in the tropical islands, Thorne assembled all of the crew and PFC employees to harass them to remain on the ship. Commercial transactions with Hawaiians saw the crew purchasing cabbage, sugar cane, purple yams, taro, coconuts, watermelon, breadfruit, hogs, goats, two sheep, and poultry in return for glass beads, iron rings, needles, cotton cloth. Upon entering Honolulu, the crew was greeted by Isaac Davis and Francisco de Paula Marin, the latter acting an interpreter in negotiations with Kamehameha I and prominent government official Kalani Moku. Twenty-four native Hawaiian Kanakas were hired with the approval of Kamehameha I, who appointed Naukane to oversee their interests. The Columbia River was reached in March 1811. Despite stormy conditions, over several days Thorne ordered two boats dispatched to scout a safe route over the treacherous Columbia Bar. Both boats would capsize and eight men lost their lives. Finally on March 24, the Tonquin crossed the bar, passing into the Columbia's estuary and laid anchor in Baker's Bay. Captain Thorne stressed the urgency for the Tonquin to start trading further north along the Pacific coast as instructed by Astor. 
After 65 days on the Columbia River, the Tonquin departed with a crew of 23 with McKay was aboard the ship as supercargo. At Vancouver Island she was boarded by the TLAO KAHT people of Clayoquot Sound, where Thorne caused an uproar by hitting a TLAO KAHT noble with a pelt. In the ensuing conflict all of men brought on the Tonquin were killed besides an interpreter from the Quinault Nation and the ship was destroyed. This put the occupants of Fort Astoria in a tough position, having no access to seaborne transport until the following year. Topic Fort Astoria Construction on Fort Astoria, an Emporium of the West, began in the middle of April 1811. It was built upon Point George, the location being about 5 miles 8 kilometers from the Lewis and Clark Expedition winter camp of Fort Clatsop. The terrain and thick forests made clearing a foundation exceedingly difficult. Late in the month, McDougall reported that there was little progress in clearing, the place being so full of half-decayed trunks, large fallen timber and thick brush. No one among the party had previous experience in the logging industry and many hadn't used an axe before in general. Trees had a layer of hardened resin and were of a massive size. Four men worked as a team on platforms at least eight feet above the ground to effectively cut a tree, with it taking typically two days for a single tree to be felled. Medical issues quickly became another major issue for the party as there was not a single medical officer among the passengers brought on the Tonquin. This left treatments rudimentary at best. During the initial months on the Columbia River at any time upwards of half of the expedition was unable to perform manual labor due to illness. Topic. Fort Okanagan Koxuma Nupaka, a two-spirit from the Katunaxa people, and his wife arrived at Fort Astoria on 15 June 1811 with a letter from John Stewart. Koxuma offered accounts of the interior and recommended that the station be opened at the confluence of the Columbia and the Okanakan River among the Sai Ilx peoples. It was determined that David Stewart would take a party to with Koxuma to the Sai Ilx. Before they left however the inhabitants of Astoria were surprised by the arrival of David Thompson on 15 July. Thompson later stated that his group set off on a voyage down the Columbia River to explore this river in order to open out a passage for the interior trade with the Pacific Ocean." The competing fur traders were cordially received at Astoria. A party of eight led by David Stewart departed on of July for the Sai Ilx territories. The personnel assigned to join Stewart were eight men, including Alexander Ross, François Benjamin Pillet, Avid de Montigny, and Naukane. The group joined David Thompson and his eight men in traveling up the Columbia, staying together until the Dalles. Upon entering Watlala Chinookan territory, Stewart failed establish favorable relations with them. Watlala men performed several military displays and stole a small amount of goods. Now Kane agreed to join the NWC shortly after this episode and the two parties separated. Stewart was able to secure the protection of Wasco Wishram leadership in early August. Groups of Chinook and laborers were used to cross the portage of the Columbia in their homeland. Stewart's party soon began to travel through the Sahaptan nations and on 12 August an assembly of Walla Walla, Cayuse and Nez Perce welcomed the fur traders. Once the reception was complete, the PFC men continued up the Columbia and passed by the future site of Fort Nez Perces. Towards the end of August the party began to become troubled with western rattlesnake populations and rapids, almost losing one canoe and the men aboard it to a section of swift currents. Stewart and his men were greeted by Wenatchee leadership at the Wenatchee River, who gave two horses to the fur traders as a gift in addition to several more being purchased. While passing through other indigenous homelands the PFC continued financial dealings for food supplies. Members of the Shalon Nation traded some salmon, roots, and berries, and later Metaus offered their abundance of salmon and many horses to the fur trappers for sale, while at the junction of the Columbia and Okanagan River, a large encampment of Sai Ilx were encountered. 
Prominent members of the nation entreated the fur traders to reside it among their people, proclaiming, "...themselves to be always be our friends, to kill us plenty of beavers, to furnish us at all times with provisions, and to ensure our protection and safety." The cargo of the canoes were taken to land on 1 September and work soon began on Fort Okanagan. A residence crafted from driftwood acquired from the Okanagan River. While construction of the post was ongoing, four men that included Pillet were detailed to inform the progress of inland trade. The party arrived back at the company headquarters on the 11th of October and gave its favorable report. Stewart led Montigny and two other men to follow the course of the Okanagan, leaving only Ross at the post. As promised, the CILX provided security for the station, frequently alerting Ross when intruders from other nations came near. Despite planning on exploring the Okanagan watershed for a month, Stewart and his three men did not return until the 22nd of March 1812. Upon reaching the Okanagan headwaters the party then went over to the Thompson River. Snows in mountain passes made it exceedingly difficult for the party to travel. Detained among the Sequipiemc, Stewart developed cordial relations with them. Finding their areas rich in beaver populations, he promised to return later that year to create a trading post. Topic: The Lower Chinookan Peoples. Diplomatic relationships with the Chinookan villages near the Columbia were critical for the viability of Fort Astoria. Scholars have affirmed that the American company and its Economic success depended on mutually beneficial economic exchanges with Indian groups who controlled trade. Many of the settlements near the station were under the influence of Hedman Comcomley. Topic assistance in exploration Chinookans were highly important in company explorations of the Pacific coast. In particular, they were instrumental in finding a suitable location for what became Fort Astoria. In early April 1811 McDougall and David Stewart visited Comcomley, who advised them not to return to the Columbia River as it was then quite tumultuous. The two men didn't listen and shortly afterward their canoe capsized in the river. The timely succor of Comcomley and his villagers ensured the partners were saved before they drowned. After recuperating there for three days, they returned to the PFC camp. Additional services tendered was the relaying information from more distant peoples to the Astorians. Reports were circulated by them in late April 1811 of a trade post maintained by white men in the interior. This was correctly conjectured by PFC employees to be their NWC rivals, later found to be Spokane House. Departing on 2 May, McKay led Robert Stewart, Franchere, Avid de Montigny and a number of voyageurs up the Columbia, with Clatsop Noble Colpo acting as guide and interpreter. The following day they explored the Cowlitz River and soon encountered a large canoe flotilla of Cowlitz warriors. McKay was able to request a parley, during which the Cowlitz stated they were armed for combat against the nearby Skilut Chinookan village near the river mouth. Reaching the Dalles on 10 May, no trade station was found at the important fishery. Due to Colpo's fear of reprisal from his enemies among the Wasco and Wishram, the party went back to Fort Astoria, returning on 14 May. Despite not finding the NWC post, management at Fort Astoria soon became anxious to acquire a knowledge of the country and the prospects of trade, within our reach. On 6 June 1811, Robert Stewart went north on a tour of Western Olympic Peninsula with Calpo acting as a guide again. Returning on 24 June, Stewart reported that the Quinault and nearby Quileute nations would kill sea otters and trade their pelts for the valuable dentalium shells sold by the Nuu Cha Nault on Vancouver Island. Stewart felt that a company trade post in Grays Harbor offered the best location to secure these furs. Additionally he gave the opinion that a ludic in Russian America should be recruited to hunt various fur-bearing animals at the hypothetical factory. However, Chinookans were not always willing to help Astorians in visiting distant locations. This was a means of delaying the Astorians from making commercial connections with indigenous peoples on the Upper Columbia. 
One particular incident has been described by historian Robert F. Jones as an effort to keep Comcomly's Chinooks as middlemen between the natives of the Upper Columbia and the Astorians. Francois Benjamin Pillet was ordered to make a trading trip along the Columbia. Accompanied by a Chinook headman, they left Fort Astoria in late June 1811. Small trade deals were completed with Skilutes near modern Oak Point. Afterwards, the headman cited the seasonal flooding as making the Columbia unsafe to travel further upriver. This forced Pillet to return to Astoria with what pelts he had purchased from the Skilutes. Topic. Commercial ties Consistently small stockpiles of foodstuffs at Fort Astoria created the need for frequent transactions with Chinookans for sustenance. Seasonal fish runs provided the major nutritional sources for the Columbian River-based natives. After ceremonial rituals during each major fish run, trade for caught fish would begin in earnest with the Astorians. A constant task for Hawaiians would be to perform fishermen duties. Major fish populations active in the Columbia included the candlefish smelt, white sturgeon, sockeye salmon and chinook salmon. This dependence on fish made it a primary food source for the Astorians, which caused some discontent among employees desiring a more familiar diet. Terrestrial animals like members of the family Cervidae such as Roosevelt elk and black-tailed deer were not found in large numbers around Fort Astoria. This made them another important source of trade for the Chinookans when visiting the PFC station. Another frequent item sold when fish supplies were low in the winter was the wapato root. Wapato provided a common source of calories for Chinookans and other nations. The Astorians described the tuber as a good substitute for potatoes. Purchases of wapato occurred in such volumes that a small cellar had to be created specifically to house the produce. Other typical purchases from Chinookans included manufactured goods. In particular woven hats were frequently bought for protection against the seasonal rains. These hats were tightly interwoven, making them essentially waterproof. Of benefit to the Astorians was that they were typically wide enough to cover the shoulders. Ross described the common artwork depicted them as checkered, with various animal designs that were not painted, but ingeniously interwoven. Chinookans near Fort Astoria employed various means of retaining their valuable middleman position between various neighboring indigenous peoples and the PFC. Additional tactics involved manipulating the perception neighboring natives had of the American company. In August 1811, a small party of Chehalis visited Fort Astoria. In dialogue with them McDougall inquired why they would rarely directly trade with the PFC. The Chehalis merchants responded that Chinooks affiliated with Comcomly claimed that the Astorians were very inveterate against their nation. McDougall concluded this story was used by Comcomly to continue his commercial hegemony over the area. Topic. Fear of hostilities It wasn't always that the Astorians, especially McDougall trusted Comcomly or Chinookans in general. His judgment of them, despite eventually marrying a daughter of Comcomly was that they were often ready to attack the fort. In particular Jones noted that he "...seems to place implicit faith in any possible hostile actions by the natives." In June 1812, the number of men at Fort Astoria were reduced to 11 Hawaiians and 39 European descendants. Fear of attack by Chinookans was high and drills were directed by McDougall frequently. A delegation of Chinookans visited Fort Astoria on 2 July quickly left after witnessing these military demonstrations. This fear by the natives convinced the Astorians that they are not friendly disposed towards us having a desire to harm us. According to Jones, this latent distrust of Chinookans by Astorians from this incident was probably unfounded, as they entered the post for an innocent purpose and were frightened by the drills. Fears of attack didn't disappear and Astorians kept themselves guarded in dealing with natives. 
After the Beaver left for Russian America rumors spread of a coming attack on Astoria in August 1812. There were large numbers of Chinookans and Chehalis near Komkomli's village at the time. This expedited construction on two bastions and the fort was put in readiness for an attack. Jones has pointed out that these movements of indigenous was very likely a part of seasonal fishing, rather than a supposed hostile gathering. Topic. Overland expedition As the leader of the expedition Hunt would make a number of decisions which were disastrous. The movement of Hunt's group has been described as a company of traders forging westward in a haphazard fashion. He ordered the expedition to leave St. Louis just before the winter to reduce company expenses of supporting employees. The group departed on October 21, 1810 for Fort Osage. The expedition traveled 450 miles 720 kilometers up the Missouri River before setting up winter camp on Nottoway Island, at the mouth of Nottoway River in Andrew County, Missouri, just north of St. Joseph. French-Canadian employees made frequent purchases from the company store during the idle season, especially those hired at Michilimackinac. Small items like blue beads, vermilion, brass rings, tobacco, carrots, small axes among others were used in transactions with Missouri neighboring the camp. On January 1811, Hunt sailed down the Missouri River to complete several pending transactions at St. Louis. It was during this time he recruited Pierre Dorian Jr., as he was the only qualified speaker of the Sioux languages in St. Louis at the time. Notably he was in debt to Manuel Lisa and the Missouri Fur Company MFC, something that would lead to tensions between the fur companies later in the year. In the end Hunt was able to secure Dorian, on the condition that Marie and his two children be brought along as well. Once finalized, he took British naturalists John Bradbury and Thomas Nuttall with him to the Nottoway camp, as previously agreed upon. The party left St. Louis on 12 March and reached Fort Osage on 8 April. Early into the travel Dorian physically abused his wife and caused her to flee for a day. At the station Ramsey Crooks was waiting for them and the group recuperated for two days. The group left Fort Osage on 10 April and during the day Dorian severely beat his squaw. As Marie desired to stay with newly made Osage acquaintances rather than continue with the expedition. The group reached the winter camp on the 17th. The Overland group at this point amounted to almost 60 men, 40 being French Canadian voyagers. Topic. Following the Missouri Hunt's expedition broke the Nottoway winter camp on April 21. The Astorians reached a major Omaha village in early May. Active commercial transactions were completed there, with Omaha merchants offering jerked buffalo meat, tallow, corn, and marrow for vermilion, beads and tobacco carrots. Bradbury detailed that the Omaha village had plots of Nicotiana rustica, melons, beans, squashes, and corn under cultivation. While at the Omaha settlement, Hunt received information from several visiting Yankton Sioux that a group of Sioux was gathering further up the river to stop the expedition from traveling further. Proceeding further the Missouri River, the Sioux party was encountered on 31 May. The Sioux bands were a conglomeration of Yankton and Lakota and had around 600 armed men. Tensions quickly arose between the two disparate groups and both took up positions by the Missouri River. The two company howitzers and single swivel gun were loaded with powder and fired to intimidate the Sioux bands. The artillery were then loaded with live ammunition, but the Sioux across the river began to spread their buffalo robes before them, and move them side to side. Dorian stopped the firing of the armaments a second time, as he understood this action by the Sioux meant they desired a parley. Peace talks were held and the Sioux explained that they had formed to prevent the PFC from trading with the neighboring nations they were at war with, the Arakara, Mandan and the Gross Venter. Hunt explained that the expedition intended to travel to the Pacific Ocean and they had no interest in the neighboring indigenous groups. 
This was found to be acceptable by the Sioux leaders, and the PFC was allowed to depart further north. On 3 June, employees of the Missouri Fur Company under the command of Manuel Lisa were encountered on the Missouri River. Lisa reminded Dorian of his pending debt to the company, and a duel between the two men was narrowly averted by Bradbury and Henry Marie Brackenridge intervening. After this incident the rival fur companies refrained from interacting and camped on opposite sides of the Missouri River. Despite this, Lisa and Hunt led their parties north towards an Arakara village and reached it on 12 June. In a council with local leadership Lisa declared that if any of Hunt's party were harmed he'd take it as an offense against him as well. In setting the standard rate for purchasing horses, carbines, powder, ball, tomahawks, knives, were in high demand as the Arakara were planning an attack upon the Sioux. Lisa and Hunt made a deal allowing for Hunt's boats to be exchanged for additional horses, kept at Fort Lisa further up the Missouri River. Crooks was sent with a small group to fetch the horses and while they reached Fort Lisa on the 23rd, they had to wait until the 25th for Lisa to arrive to finalize the transaction. The party left the following day and returned south to Hunt's camp. Topic. The Rocky Mountains While at the Arakara village, Hunt met and employed several American trappers that had previously worked for the MFC in modern Idaho. The men advised strongly against going into the Pekinese homelands of modern Montana. The Pekinese and other Nitsitapi nations at the time were typically unreceptive to trespass from European descendants and made a showing of military force against the Lewis and Clark expedition. This changed Hunt's plans, who according determined it best to avoid the Nitsitapi peoples. The expedition left their Arakara hosts in late July for the nearby Grand River. After following the Little Missouri River, the party to rest for several days while transactions were made with a band of Cheyenne. In total 36 horses were purchased from the Cheyenne. The expedition broke camp on 6 August and Hunt ordered six men to hunt bison. Hunt's party continued southwest through the modern state of Wyoming and the hunting party rejoined on 18 August, having killed eight bison. While at the base of Cloud Peak on 30 August, a scouting party of Apsaluk visited the camp. The following day a delegation of Apsaluk on horseback invited them to visit their nearby village. Hunt recalled the importance of mercantile deals with the Apsaluk stating that we spent the first day of September buying some robes and belts and trading our tired, maimed horses for fresh ones, thereby augmenting the number of our horses to about 121, most of which were well trained and able to cross the mountains. Continuing westward towards the continental divide of the Americas, the PFC party followed the course of the Wind River, crossed the divide, and followed the Gross Venter River. Snake River The expedition reached Fort Henry on 8 September, made by MFC employee Andrew Henry the previous year, near present-day St. Anthony and made a camp there. The post was and was later abandoned. While at the location work began creating enough canoes necessary to take the party down Henry's Fork and later the Snake River or so-called Mad River to the Columbia. This was done as it felt no longer necessary to travel with pack horses, a decision that would soon cause more issues for the party. On the 10th, four men and two natives under the command of Joseph Miller departed to begin trapping in the area. The horses that remained in the possession of the PFC, amounting to 77, were left in the care of two young snakes. The party departed from Fort Henry on 19 September on the newly made canoes. Traveling down the Snake River proved highly difficult due to the many rapids such as Cauldron Lynn. The party was forced to perform multiple portage due to these fierce currents. Over course of the remainder of September through early November, four incidents of canoes capsizing killed one man meant major losses in trade goods and food supplies. 
In addition to the hardships caused from attempting to follow the course of the snake more problems arose due to dwindling food stockpiles. By 31 October there was enough provisions to last for five days. In early November there were not many animals in the area to gather for food, the few that were caught by the hunting parties were beaver. The traveling partners agreed to end travel by canoe, finding the mode of transportation too difficult to continue using. Hunt ordered several groups go in various directions to contact neighboring indigenous for material support. In the meantime the PFC expedition began to deposit its trade goods in small caches to lighten the workload of the men. At the suggestion of Ramsey Crooks, the expedition was divided into two parties of 19 men each, with each member receiving five. One. Four. Display style TFRAC 1 4 pounds of dried meat. A third small group was led by Donald Mackenzie to reach Fort Astoria ahead of the main contingent. All that remained in the company stores was 40 pounds of corn, 20 of fat, and nearly 5 pounds of bouillon tablets. On 9 November, the two groups began traveling on either side of the snake. Soon the cliffs became too steep to allow an easy descent to the river banks for water. Sources of hydration became very limited and despite intercourse with several groups of indigenous the situation didn't improve. Water was collected on 20 November after it rained the previous night. Up to that point, several Canadians had begun to drink their urine. In desperation, Crooks reunited with Hunt's party in early December alone. Crooks was so weakened from starvation that his pace would have slowed the expedition immensely. Hunt left two men to tend to Crooks while the main group pushed forward. Several villages of northern Shoshone were visited and vitally needed food sources such as horses along with some dried fish, a few roots, and some pounded dried cherries were purchased. A Shoshone was convinced to act as a scout to guide the PFC group to the Umatilla River. On 23 December, 13 men assigned to Crook's party were met who gave the unfortunate news that they hadn't seen him since he left Hunt's group. Topic. Reaching the Columbia Donald Stewart and his party of Robert McClellan, John Reed, Etienne Lucier and seven other men continued to march ahead of the two main PFC groups. While traversing the lands of the Nimipu, a stranded employee of the PFC, Archibald Pelton, was found and brought along with the party. They finally arrived at Fort Astoria on 18 January 1812. The party was described as clothed in nothing but fluttering rags. While waiting for the main contingent under Hunt to arrive, the men informed the personnel of the overland journey's progress from St. Louis. Hunt's group found a band of Lixiu on 8 January, whom hosted the downtrodden expedition for a week. Meals of dried mule deer meat and loaves of pounded commas bulbs were provided during their stay. While exploring the area, Hunt found out from particular Lixiu that there was an active white fur trader in the area. This would turn out to be Jacques Raphael Finley, located at the NWC Spokane House. On 21 January, the expedition finally reached the banks of the Columbia River. Hunt soon entered discussions with the Wasco Wishram when entering their villages. It was here he learned the destruction of the Tonquin the previous year. The remaining three horses of the party were used to purchase two canoes from Wasco merchants. Several portages were required on the Columbia, especially at the Cascade Rapids. The main body of the expedition reached Fort Astoria on 15 February to much fanfare. Besides Hunt there was 30 men, along with Marie Ioi Dorian and her two children on six canoes. McDougall was apprehensive about feeding all these additional people, a sentiment Franchier shared, as the post had recently faced issues with provisions. Due to seasonal salmon runs harvested by various Chinookans however, there was a sizable food supply at Fort Astoria. Topic. Activities in 1812 
Topic: Attempted expedition to interior. In late March, three clerks in command of 14 men were ordered to depart for the hinterlands. Robert Stewart was to take needed trade goods to Fort Okanagan. John Reed was to take food supplies to the stranded crooks and day, in addition to later taking dispatches for Astor to St. Louis. Russell Farnham was to retrieve the caches left by Hunt near Fort Henry. To complete several of the necessary portage at the Dalles, Wascos were hired to help freight the trade goods. Two bales of trade goods and later some personal items were however stolen. Stewart ordered his men to complete the portage during the night. A skirmish arose at sunrise between arriving Wascos and Reed, who was defending several bales of goods with one man. After being grievously injured, Reed lost the box containing the dispatches. Additional PFC arrived at the scene and two natives were reportedly killed in the struggle. The Chinookans returned in larger numbers and armed several hours later. To avoid more bloodshed Stewart was able to negotiate a settlement with the aggrieved families. In return for a reported six blankets and tobacco, the Astorians were able to continue their journey up the Columbia. The conflict raised security concerns of crossing into further indigenous nations, forcing the three parties to all travel to Fort Okanagan. Arriving there on 24 the April, the clerks, voyagers and trappers departed for Fort Astoria on the 29th, leaving Alexander Ross and two men at the station. Stockpiles of pelts accumulated there amounted to an estimated 2,500 were taken as well. Near the mouth of the Umatilla River the party was surprised to loudly hear English shouted among an assembled group of indigenous, perhaps Umatilla. Ramsey Crooks and John Day were there them, exhausted from several months of tribulations. Wandering over a large area, the two men at one point received the help of an Umatilla noble, Yekka Tap Am, who, in particular treated us like a father. After being robbed by another band of natives, Crooks and Day were able to find the Umatilla once more. Taking two worn men with them, the party reached Fort Astoria on the 11th of May. Topic: The Beaver. The Beaver was the second supply ship sent by Astor to the Pacific coast, with Cornelius Soul as its captain. It sailed from New York City in October 1811 and reached Fort Astoria on 9 May 1812. While stopping at the Kingdom of Hawaii, more men were recruited as Kanakas for the company. After unloading necessary supplies to the fort, the Beaver sailed to Russian America. Hunt joined the crew to negotiate with RAC Governor Alexander Andreevich Baranov at New Archangel. The cargo was purchased by the Russians amounted to 124,000 in value, with payment in seal skins located on St. Paul Island. Orders from Astor dictated that the ship to return to the Columbia, but the Beaver was in poor repair and sailed for the Kingdom of Hawaii instead. Hunt was left there as the Beaver went west to Guangzhou. News of the War of 1812 kept the ship at the port for the remainder of the conflict. The Beaver then proceeded to New York City and entered the city harbor in 1816. Topic: Second Interior Expedition. Failure to accomplish many of the tasks set for work the hinterland earlier in 1812 did not discourage the Astorians. The supplies and reinforcements brought aboard the Beaver made management consider grander schemes. For the summer, new establishments would be created to challenge the NWC across the region in addition to pursuing trading expeditions among various indigenous nations. A total of almost 60 men were directed to locations from the Willamette Valley of Oregon to the Bitterroot Valley of Montana and the vicinity of modern Kamloops in British Columbia. The movement of workers to their assigned locales began in late June. Robert Stewart led a party bound for St. Louis to send information to Astor as Reed had attempted earlier in the year. His group was composed two French Canadians and four Americans. John Day became afflicted by mental instability and Stewart paid several Multnomah men of Cathlipotl village to transport him back to Fort Astoria. 
The group would make the important discovery of the South Pass, critical for the later westward movement of tens of thousands of American migrants. Topic. Liquidation Funds provided by Astor established several major trading stations across the Pacific Northwest. While intended to gain control of the regional fur trade, the Pacific Fur Company would ultimately flounder. This came from a variety of issues, many caused by the tumultuous diplomatic relationship between the United Kingdom and the United States. The destruction of the Tonquin left Fort Astoria under-supplied and heavily reliant upon neighboring Chinookans for sustenance. Competition from the interior-based Northwest Company threatened to the loss of major fur-producing Oregon country regions. The Overland Expedition would arrive many months later than planned by Astor. Wilson Hunt's inexperience in the outback and along with dwindling supplies would leave the majority of the expedition facing starvation. While the arrival of the Beaver brought much needed trading goods, foodstuffs and additional employees, events would soon see the ending of the PFC. News of the War of 1812 was relayed to the Astorians at Fort Spokane, information that Donald Mackenzie brought to Fort Astoria in January 1813. As Franchere recalled, a council of clerks and management noted that the Astorians were almost to a man British subjects, forcing them to agree to abandon the establishment of Fort Astoria and its secondary stations. A British warship was learned from NWC clerks to be en route to capture the station. The PFC management agreed to sell its assets across the Oregon country, formalized on 23 October 1813 with the raising of the Union Jack. On 30 November HMS Raccoon arrived at the Columbia River and in honor of George III of the United Kingdom Fort Astoria was renamed Fort George. On board the Raccoon was John MacDonald who oversaw the formal takeover of PFC properties. Later in March 1814, the NWC's ship Isaac Todd arrived on the Columbia, delivering much-needed supplies to Fort George. She then sailed on to China, and England. She carried some PFC personnel, many of whom were former employees of the NWC, back to England, from where they returned to Montreal. Topic. Legacy During a NWC shareholder meeting in July 1814, the partners declared that the sale greatly facilitated the getting out of the Pacific country our competitors the American Fur Company. They also concluded that the sale of Astoria and other PFC properties gave considerable advancements for their company. Plans were considered to use the stations much in the same manner Astor meant, for trade with China. The Columbia also offered a less costly means of supplying the interior NWC posts in the region. The Treaty of 1818 established a joint occupancy of the Pacific Northwest between the United States and the United Kingdom was confirmed, each nation agreeing not to inhibit the activities of each other's citizens. During 1821, the British government ordered the NWC to be merged in their long-time rivals, the Hudson's Bay Company. In a short time the HBC controlled the majority of the fur trade across the Pacific Northwest. This was done in a manner that the Americans were forced to acknowledge that Astor's dream of a multi-continent economic web had been realized. By his enterprising and far-sighted competitors, the PFC held additional influence on the region in some particular and subtle ways. The book Astoria was written by Washington Irving in 1836, after interviewing some men connected to the venture and consulting documents held by Astor. Two surviving members of the Astorians, Etienne Lucier and Joseph Gervais, would later become farmers on the French prairie and participate in the Shampui meetings. Topic. See also Maritime fur trade 
Northwest Company.